Good morning to our viewers in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us today. Just yesterday, on July 1st, Germany assumed the six month rotating presidency of the European Council. It's not an understatement to say that Germany takes on this role at a critical juncture for Europe. Berlin had ambitious plans for the next six months, but the public health and economic implications of the corona crisis have forced Berlin to recalibrate its priorities. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Ulrike Gerot to discuss what we can expect of Germany during the coming months. Ulrike Gerot heads the Department of European Policy and the Study of Democracy at the Danube University in Krems, Austria. She is also the founder of the Berlin-based European Democracy Lab. The European Democracy Lab is a forward-looking think tank that is focused on generating innovative ideas, innovative ideas and solutions for Europe. Ulrike, it is so good to see you today. Thank you for joining us. Um, Stephen and all listeners in the US and in Europe, it's my pleasure to be with you for an hour and a half to discuss the German EU presidency. Um, I have been so many times live in the US with the ACG uh, doing so many speaking tours. So I'm very thankful to reactivate a little bit the transatlantic relationship and to talk about American European relation in a critical junction of time. I mean, there's no need to underline at which critical junction we are. There is a transatlantic rupture um, due to many factors, which I probably do not need to enumerate. On top of everything, there comes COVID-19 with um, horrible pictures, especially from the United States, which are coming to us. Uh, you have a presidential uh, race going on. There is ongoing and sharp discussion about NATO and transatlantic relations just now, and basically tough negotiations. So all this is the broader geoeconomic and geostrategic context, which I think is worth mentioning before coming more in depth into the German EU presidency. Just to be in, in that regard, um, I mean, you're absolutely right in sort of setting a, a wide stage. Um, Germany is now almost two full days into the six-month presidency of the European Council, and there's a lot on the agenda for Europe, right? I mean, Brexit has not been resolved, climate change is on the agenda, relations with China, the transatlantic relationship that you just touched on, and of course this all is set against the backdrop of COVID-19 recovery and European cohesion. So why don't you start by laying out Berlin's priorities for the next six months and the impact that the corona crisis has had on changing the agenda? Well, I mean, the first thing to mention is that this is the first German presidency since 2007. So it's all 14 years and it's basically a very big thing. The second thing to mention is that we are coming from a Croatian presidency, having Bulgaria, Eastland, Estonia before we will be uh, passing on. Um, so um, Germany is a big country and it's very different for the European Union that Germany has an EU presidency than tinier countries uh, because Germany is the largest economy, is in the middle of Europe and basically has a moving capacity. Uh, there's nothing in the European Union that is going on without or against Germany. And so there is a high expectation now with respect to the German presidency, which also Germany needs to manage because there is uh, basically a very huge expectation expectation that after uh, uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic um, that Germany can bring out the European Union out of the crisis. But on the other hand, there is some dialectics in it. And I think it's worth to mention this before going deeper into the presidency paper. Because with all the expectation that Germany is a big country and will move things, there is also this, say, um, uh, suspicion that is Germany truly European again? Because looking back at the last crisis, the banking crisis, euro crisis, uh, austerity crisis, we have been think, uh, saying, and basically there were American uh, observers writing the same thing up and down, that we had a sort of German moment in Europe. And it was a moment in 2011, 12, 13, where basically German sneaked out of Europe, um, exported largely to China, basically the crisis management of 10 years ago 
for Germany was to let the single market go, to go to China and to not care that much for Europe. And I think in the lasting memory of the tinier countries, especially the southern countries of the European Union, this German moment of Europe, there's always this Stefan Zweig saying European Germany or German Europe, this German Europe hangs a little bit like clouds. And so not only now there is high expectations towards the German EU presidency, but there's also the expectation, will Germany finally come back to the European, say, game, right? And um, the short answer is, yes, it is. Yes, it is. What we can see is that there is an in-depth change in German public opinion. You can see that this presidency starts with the high announcement of Merkel-Macron European Rescue Fund's plan of uh, 750 um, billions of uh, euros that there is for the first time, and this is the novum, that there will be mutualized lending of the European Union as juridical entity. So for the first time, it's not debt mutualization, it's not about the debt of the past, but it's common interest rates for the future. So the money which is now taken on will be European money lended by the European Union as its capacity. And then the European Union will basically manage to distribute this uh, money. And uh, here I am saying that this is probably one of the biggest elements of this presidency because it's again both. It's a sign that Germany is much more serious about Europe. Still the other question is will that Merkel-Macron deal get through? It's still in discussion. You have probably heard about the so-called frugal four, Sweden, Denmark, uh, the, the, the Netherlands and Austria uh, going against this uh, common uh, scheme of lending. Um, but the other question is, even though you get the Merkel-Macron plan, is it the Hamilton -momian, Hamiltonian moment many people were speaking about? You have probably noticed that in the German press there were many people arguing, yes, this is brand new, this is the Hamiltonian moment. Hendrik Enderlein, a very um, renowned uh, uh, director of Hertie School of Governance, had interviews in FAZ, had interviews in Spiegel, basically arguing that this is really new with respect to the capacity of the European Union. But if you go a little bit more in detail into the figures, what is really Really happening that the 500 billion direct aid will increase the inter the the the, the transnational so the all overboarding spending the real um, fiscal transfer will increase for 0.6 percentage. So you can argue both. It is a novum, but it's still not a Hamiltonian moment because with 0.6 percentage of increase. Yes, still, it's something better than nothing, but is it the big sort of boom where you would argue that now the European Union is structurally um, changing? We will need to see. Perhaps it's a step into the right direction, but probably not much more. Going a little back to the scenery, we have also a German Chancellor, Mrs. Merkel, who has now definitely uh, said loudly and uh, numerously that it's her last mandate. She will not be German Chancellor beyond September next year. We have for the first time, and that's all since long, also very important in this moment of time, a German EU Commissioner, uh, President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. We have a French president, Macron, who has been doing many speeches that Europe needs to get sovereignty, that Europe needs to be much more independent in the digitalization, but also in foreign policy and so on and so forth, who is now after the local election in France, which we have seen last Sunday, desperately in need for a European sort of big thing, because if not, he's probably going to fail the next election because he's deeply under stress. So putting this together, um, I think there's a legacy to make around the people who are now doing this presidency. There's Angela Merkel, who has not much to lose other than her legacy in the history books. There's Ursula von der Leyen, who has a lot to earn and to gain because she will have European elections in 2024 and she needs to bring out Europe out of this crisis. And there's a French president eager to perform which in itself is an interesting new dynamic because we haven't seen a functioning Franco-German tandem for long. So I guess you have seen that Macron and Merkel were talking to each other and there was a visit. So we need to now carefully observe what is coming out of this. And then um, with respect to what is happening and what are the novelties of this German presidency, if we are reading, if you read the presidency paper, this is 23 pages paper, 
uh, let me just quickly go through it. Obviously, these presidency papers are broad, uh, comprehensive papers. There's everything in from foreign policy to democratization of the European Union, especially now the Green New Deal, modernization of technologies, electromobility, digitalization are the buzzwords which are coming. In all these buzzwords, what is really astonishing is that for the first time, the European people say the European citizens are back. I would argue that this time is a moment of understanding that you cannot have a construction like the European Union without a clear linkage between what the European citizen want and what is in for them in such a recovery plan. So there is a lot of talk about participation, democratization and citizen connection with the policy of the European Union. Secondly, what is new, that there is a lot of talk about what you call public goods, that the European Union should be there to provide public goods. We have been having that pandemic, so there is a talk about the European Pandemic Agency, there is talk about the European Public Health Service, there is also, and this is in a way brand new, um, the plans for a Euro European unemployment scheme are also mentioned in the EU Presidency Paper of Germany. Just to look back to history, 10 years ago in 2014 when we already had first plans about the European unemployment uh, uh, scheme this was basically wiped off the table by the council by then because nobody was believing and so the social pillar of the European Union but now with the crisis forthcoming unemployment going high and uh, social crisis looming at the horizon I think the European Union has understand that has understood that if it wants to work in the interest of the European people or say the European citizens because there's no European demos, um, then we do have to complete the social pillar. And perhaps some of you may have noticed that the European Union had an e, uh, an, a big social summit in Göteborg back to November 2017. And what is an interesting detail, but very interesting in the plans of the German presidency is that the social pillar, which has been inaugurated in the Göteborg summit in 2017, shall be lifted to constitutional level in the framework of the um, of the constitutional documents of the European Union. So I would say to just basically sum it up a little bit, um, yes, it is an extraordinary presidency because it's Germany, because Germany can run things and can manage things, because there's a high expectation, because we are in a non in an historical moment in time and because we see novelties in the way that the European Commission and the presidency are shaping the program. So I repeat, it's about public goods, the citizens are back, there's a lot about um, uh, social things coming and getting for the first time into a presidential paper. And these are for me a little bit the new bias, the new language of the paper. Obviously, the European presidency is about the classical stuff. Let's call it the more classical stuff. The European Union needs to convene on a budget by the end of the year because we need to have a budget by 2021. And this will be a nitty gritty sort of negotiation work. Um, obviously, the whole geostrategic panorama is in, which is the geoeconomy and geostrategy post-corona. There's a lot which I hope I can discuss with you about the new European positioning between the US and China, because if something the pandemic has brought up is that where's Europe? I mean, there is this dependency from the US, as we call it, with respect to the digitalization business and the smart industries like GAFA complex. And there is this dependency from China that we realized during the pandemia, uh, dependency from medical uh, equipment, from um, many things. So this emergence of the desire of more European both independency in economic terms and sovereignty in political terms, which is obviously linked, is, I think, a new phenomenon. And the real question, I think, if you read through a couple of, say, high-end analyses of where Europe is positioning itself now, I think there's a looming but, say, tasteist question. The, test, the, the, the thing is not really pronounced, yeah, like a little bit like if you read Harry Potter, Lord Voldemort's, the person's name we not ought to pronounce. But there is, I think, a looming question in Europe, can we still go independent? 
because there's something about the desire that Europe realizes somewhere we need to be between these US and China sort of game. Where are we both economically and politically? But the more sublimated question is, even if we wish to be, can we still? Where are our past dependencies in the military, in the engineering, in medical, in the high technologies like nanotechnologies, the whole where, where either the US has it or China has it. And I think these are the interesting topics and what I can see, or perhaps I shall end my little impulse with this reflection. I think there are really two parts of the European discussion. There is say the high and upper class way of classical EU discussion, that one that I just pronounced, EU and foreign policy, EU and China, EU and the US, uh, the, 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 the high politics stuff, yeah, which is sort of uh, where the real power game and the real power play is and is still, and where perhaps I would easily admit Europe is at the losing end. But if you look at it from a, say, European citizen's perspective, and you are for a second not too much bothered about these high-end geopolitical, geostrategic games, my argument would be that the European presidency is indeed renovating itself with the things that I mentioned beforehand, which is this new dimension of citizens' consultations. Perhaps you have known that Mrs. von der Leyen is about to launch a two-year-long um, conference on the future of Europe, where she will consult European citizens in a two-year process. So there is this democratization, participation, social pillar, uh, public goods for the citizens component, which is which a little bit seems like a quite different um, discussion when we are discussing Europe. And the interesting thing is that the, the two are existing. So the half is really, the glass is really half full and half empty because on the high end politics, you can easily lose your faith in Europe. On the say low end citizen participatory mechanism, there's a lot going on in Europe and it, it's all about the towns are back, networks of towns are back, new formats of democracies are back, uh, participatory elements in democracy are, are in, reinvented. So um, these are the two sides on how I look at the European Union at this moment in time. And the, Europe, the German presidency will probably be necessary and good to moderate through the two angles of these aspects. Well, Ulrika, thank you so much. As usual, you have um, set the stage beautifully. You've put a lot out there. And there are a lot of different directions that we can go in in, in our conversation. Um, because of the breadth of, of your comments just now, I don't know that we'll unpack everything, um, but let's, let's try to unpack some of it. I found it particularly interesting in, in your remarks to think about this troika um, of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, Angela Merkel, and Emmanuel Macron. Um, I had been planning on asking you about specific pairs, um, but not necessarily been thinking about the, the three of them together, but as you say, each of them has a lot resting on the next three months, both for domestic political reasons, um, for in the case of Macron, but also in terms of, of her future as the, the commissioner of the European, uh, the president of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. But as we think about sort of the next six months, I guess one question that I have for you is, do you think it matters that there is a German as the president of the European Commission and a German presidency of the European Council. Obviously, Ursula von der Leyen and Angela Merkel have a very close relationship. Um, one of them is in the early days of her new position. The other is thinking about her legacy. But they both have a lot riding on, on being successful over the next few months. Can you talk a little bit about that interplay between the two of them and, and how that might help the European process? The interesting thing is that Mrs. von der Leyen was not a Spitzenkandidat. So basically she was not to be elected in the parliamentary elections of the European Parliament last year in May in 2019. So she was a little bit the surprise candidate and even more interestingly she was put into the ring by Macron. It wasn't even Germany who suggested 
von der Leyen, but Macron. So in a way, von der Leyen is more the French candidate than the German candidate, but in addition, she is a German and obviously has good relations to Angela Merkel because she was minister for, she was four times minister and different ministers, uh, that position that she hold over the last uh, 12 years. So yes, I think it's a very interesting and important combination, not to be forgotten, uh, Christine Lagarde at ECB. Yeah, because Christine Labarde at ECB not only is owns only also a French choice, yeah, and it's very important to have Lagarde at ECB with her washing experience beforehand. Uh, may I say this as a woman? It's also interesting to see that we have a triumvirate of three women, yeah, Lagarde, uh, von der Leyen, Merkel. And there are two ways to look at this. Uh, the positive one, or let's start with the negative one. In sociology, you say that any um, policy field or even every profession which is majoritarily run by women is losing in importance. So there you would say if Europe is run by women, it's just losing out. Yeah, because the men are elsewhere doing the China business. I don't know what they do, but now Europe is left to the women. They can sweep behind men who got it wrong. That would be, yeah. The, the novelty is that perhaps the women do it differently and perhaps it's a moment where things should be done differently. And here I can really see that Merkel, who has nothing to lose, having a good relationship to Macron or increasingly good relationship to Macron and von der Leyen, and it must be said, who has seven children, and who is said to be, I don't know this personally, but who is said to be very influenced by her 20, 25, 30 year old children, who systematically that's brought into the so more yellow pressed Germany, but always pressured by her own children, like give us a European future. Mm -hmm. So there is a generational divide, there is a female or gender divide in the way you look at things in Europe. And that's why I did my impulse statement a little bit on this high classical sort of classical way to look at the EU, you know, um, foreign policy analysis, power games, China, US, or you look at this more, say, soft power skills, where the EU always has been very good. And this is about this new participatory formats, the role of towns. Yeah, if you look at what happened in France in the local elections, uh, now with this green wave, with uh, towns who say, say, okay, I can't solve the climate crisis, but I can get cars out of Lyon, which is this sort of bottom up approach. And there's increasingly something going on. I cannot judge where this will be ending, but I would bet that the very fact that you have these three women, also Lagarde, who is a non-ideological uh, director of the ECB, may be tipping point character uh, beyond the big radar of the normal power play of the European Union. You, you just um, brought France into the conversation as well, and I, I certainly want to come back um, to the, the issue of Macron and, and Merkel. You and I, over the years, have talked a lot about the Franco-German engine, how it's been strong at times, how it's sputtered at times, uh, how it virtually ceased. Um, and yet there was a tremendous amount of hope, I think, that, the, that, that under Macron and Merkel, the Franco-German engine would come back to life and, and really drive um, greater unity within Europe um, and greater strength in, within Europe. We certainly see some signs of that. Um, with the proposed recovery plan. And I guess it, it would be very interesting for us to hear your thoughts on the relationship between Macron and Macron, um, but also your thoughts on this recovery plan, uh, particularly in light of the fact that it has not been passed yet and that there are still some internal debates um, with the frugal four, as, as you mentioned. Um, so can you perhaps talk, talk a little bit about that? Let's start with the Franco-German engine. I have been writing a lot about this and I'm the first to do both, defend the Franco-German engine, but also criticizing it largely, especially in the last Euro crisis. I mean, if we look back in the years 2011, 12, 13, 14 with Hollande and this huge, huge misunderstanding between France and Germany, um, I think if we remember the 50th birthday in 2013, I have never seen uh, a worse situation in the Franco-German engine and basically it did not much recover. So if there's now recovery, it's a recovery since a um, very short time. And also this must be admitted, it's a by default recovery. I think this Merkel-Macron also comes by the despair 
that now something needs to happen. It's not this sort of now we do Europe like call me Torrent de law, like in the good old times when people would just say, let's do the Euro. I mean, <laughs> like you told, let's do the Euro was a quite utopian project. And I think Europe these days, and I think this is not a secret for everybody in this call, with Europe also plunging into populism, nationalism, whatever, economic downturns and so, that we are far beyond these utopian moments where, you, where leaders could just say, let's do this, let's do that. So if the Franco-German couple is back, it is back by default. And this is important. Let's not forget that Macron did six important speeches in Athens, in Brussels, in Sorbonne, where he urged the Germans to respond and never ever get a decent, got a decent German response. So it's basically COVID-19 who brought this up. Um, how sustainable is it? Um, to give you my fair impression, um, I'm not convinced that Macron will be the next president in France after what happened Sunday. What happened in Sunday was, is in micro analysis for France, is very interesting. First, what we see is that Macron is a, in Germany you would say Wasserkopf uh, head of state, like a waterhead um, sitting in a Paris bubble of La République en Marche. And we have seen that all his desire to plant La République en Marche in the constituencies and the local towns and so have so far failed. So there is a huge disappointment with Macron getting grounded. And um, if the seeds are not planted and now time is running out because presidential elections are in May 22, um, I think there are other dynamics at work. So which dynamics are at work? There's an interesting dynamic to see that Les Républicains, the um, UMP, Gaulliste, uh, uh, Sarkozy's party, is in a way back. Uh, uh, Philippe, the prime minister, uh, probably mayor of Le Havre, uh, is a very important figure to, to having impressed the French people how he ran COVID-19 crisis, is a serious threat uh, in, to Macron. But in a way, what is also back is globalization. And I think basically in a transatlantic dimension is it's really interesting because I think that the most innovative, say, um, things from the US is this uh, racism discussion, uh, Black Lives Matters, is the towns who are positioning, is Los Angeles and Francisco people who are say, I don't feel represented by the president. It's a little bit like Lyon, like Bordeaux, like Marseille, who see, I can't solve the climate question. I'm against the, what the EU is doing is not enough, but I can get Lyon free of cars. And I think that is a very interesting thing. Why I'm saying this in the Franco-German dimension? Because the real question today is, what is France? What is France? Is France the waterhead thing of Macron Paris bubble? And basically, it's not much more than this. La République en marche, some BCBG, you would say, you know, French smart people running Paris. Is it Gilets Jaunes, the revolt from the streets in the regions in the far, in the left behind regions, the more rural regions? Or is it the smart towns, climate, open, protective, and so on? So there are at least three Frances if not a false France, and the false France is obviously Marine Le Pen, Rassemblement National, and also some towns, per Perpignan, who are now with her. So um, in that sense, and it's important, even though I would argue that it's important that Fra Merkel and Macron get their deal done, and I will talk to the deal uh, in a moment, it is very important to understand that I think what is really happening in Europe is a big crisis of representation, and that the classical framing, Franco-German tandem is the engine of Europe. And if Merkel and Macron understand and they take von der Leyen with her, then there's a Franco-German deal and the rest of Europe will follow. These are the old times, I would argue, even though I say it would be very important to get that Franco-German deal in this moment. But the crisis of representation means that we have increasingly the towns speaking up, mayors speaking up, not only the French mayors now, but for instance, uh, perhaps some of you have noticed that when we had the refugee crisis, we had the four mayors of Warsaw, uh, Budapest, uh, Prague and Bratislava, who basically would say, I do not feel represented by my prime minister in the European Council. I, I'm not, I'm the mayor of Budapest and I'm not feel represented by Orban. I want to take refugees. So there is a town 
head of state sort of struggle, which leads fully into a crisis of representation in the European Union. And so regions are coming, the citizens are coming, the towns are coming. And I'm saying this more in an analytical perception because I'm an academic, I look at these things and I see, I see something breaking up, which, and now I talk to the Franco-German deal, is not helping us. It's breaking up, but still we need the Franco-German deal. Yeah, But you, you may understand that perhaps it's the last deal of that sort, because if we are in this crisis of representation that may lead to different articulation of democracy making in Europe, then Franco-German deals is the wording of yesterday, because when you are Dutch or Portuguese or Finnish, what do you say about a Franco-German deal? Yeah. So there is more a momentum, and I think this is a strong momentum, that more or less many have understood. If we come out, in together, out together, was the framing of the pandemic, in together, out together. Mm -hmm. And what we are discussing with the Franco-German deal is financial transfers over borders. There's a huge legitimacy question in. There is a very legitimatory question whether you can spend German taxpayers money via a rescue fund, European rescue fund, and to give this money to Spain. And then Spain, for instance, is going to get a basic income. So German taxpayers would via Europe fund a basic income in Spain without getting a basic income themselves. So they are huge legitimatory question sort of who gets what? You are, we are all European citizens, but if you're a Spaniard, perhaps you get a basic income. If you are Greek, you don't get the basic income. So there are ultimate, ultimately huge legitimacy question um, ahead. But still, because we are now discussing them, I think there's a very interesting reframing going on. And the reframing is now, and it comes from the industry. That is also very important, perhaps also for American uh, listeners here, that the drive behind this is indeed industries more than politician. Um, because what industries are saying, we are not saving the Italians. We are not saving the Greek or the Portuguese. What we are saving is the single market and the currency from which we are living ourselves. So we are they asked of them, wir sitzen, uh, how do you say this? The tree on which we are sitting ourselves. So it was the German BDI Industry Confederation together with the French MIDEF Industry Federation, together with Confindustria, the Italian uh, Con Industry Confederation, who did a common paper. And it's very interesting to know that this common paper of the three big industries associations would be issued roughly 10 days before Merkel Macron. So again, Merkel Macron is by default because they realized we need to do something. But I would bet that against industries, it would never have taken place. So it's important that the driver who wants to wipe off the table this we against them discussion, the Germans against the Italians, the Dutch against the Austrians, the, or the Dutch against the Italians, the uh, whatever Austrians against the Portuguese, the North against the South, that this is slowly but carefully wiped away because the reframing is now we save the single market and the single market is accessible for every European citizen so because that is so we do no longer differentiate in perspective between an Italian, a Greek, a Dutch or a German and this is so because in difference to the last crisis Germany has no rescue out of the crisis with China. The last crisis was basically Germany left behind the single market and exported to China. You can see a super peak in German Chinese export in 2011 as a straight consequence of the crisis by then. Because COVID-19 cuts through globalization, the exportation sort of rescue thing is no longer available. And the car industry out of which Germany was dying is basically ending. And so never ever Germany needed the European single market as much than now. And because German industries has understood we need the single market, but then the single market is not a market, a market is citizens. So if we want to stabilize the market, we need to convince the citizens that there's something in for them in the market. That is why now the social pillar of all these things 
come around. Mm -hmm. And this is why the Franco-German plan in essence is so important because if the lending is done through European Commission and if the EU Commission or the EU as such is then distributing the money, the idea is that it can be evenly distributed among European citizens without retracing whether you give it to the Italians or the Spaniards. Well, thank you for that, because of course the framing question for our conversation today was whether or not Germany can bring Europe together at this time. And you've talked a little bit about ways in which there's some hope for the rebirth of this, of this European ideal and looking at European citizenship as ra rather than national citizenship in all of this. But we've gotten um, a couple of viewer questions that hone in on something that you, that you touched on on those comments just now, which have to do with authoritarian movements, primarily in, in Eastern Europe, and authoritarian leadership and, and regimes also in, in Eastern Europe. Um, one of our viewers wants to know how the EU will maintain its cohesion in face of member states with authoritarian leadership uh, and another one wants to know um, about the, the relevance of, of those countries and those movements um, in or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the plan for economic recovery. So I guess the, the question to you is, is given the fact that um, the European Union is trying to pull Europe together again and under Germany's leadership of the European Council, there's hope that that will happen through initiatives like um, the macron macro plan. And yet in parts of Europe, um, there's splintering. So how does one deal with these um, more populist uh, authoritarian movements? Well, thank you for the question. It's really a very interesting question. I think it cuts through what I tried to uh, lay out here, which is this crisis of representation. Because sure, we can, easily go for authoritarian regimes, Orban, um, cutting of the parliament during COVID-19, Poland. And this is sort of the legal level or the political level. And then obviously Orban is in the council, authoritarian tendency, the European Union deploys Article 7. We need to do rule of law proceedings, which we have ongoing with Poland, and with um, Hungary, and it's hard uh, because you always have a delay between these proceedings are long to not say endless proceedings. It's very, very complicated as we have seen with the Polish judges and the movements of uh, uh, judge, uh, judges in, in Poland where the European Commission intervened. So these are the tricky political sort of uh, classical policy stuff where it's easy to say there is a totalitarian, authoritarian government. On the other hand, and this is what I call crisis of representation, look at the Polish presidential election of last Sunday. Out of the blues, there were this mayor of Warsaw emerging, like I'm a free open town mayor, and now Duda at least is put into question and his re-election is um, uh, pending. Um, for Hungary, it's very interesting to see that it's uh, always authoritarian Hungary, but still if you go down the figures, the Hungarian society, despite being locked off, uh, say, public discussions, I mean, if you, since basically 10 years, you have no more progressive journals in Hungary, free press, you know, you really indoctrination by government media. So you would say, what do they know in the first place about Europe? Because they are just uh, basically Orban is hanging out posters that Soros is a bad guy. And you know, I mean, all these conspiracy. But still in empirical data, the Hungarian society is astonishingly European. Mm -hmm. um, on the question, for instance, uh, would you give your national Hungarian passport away for a European passport? you have 70% of Hungarians who say yes. So it's quite interesting that you have on the societal level, one level below the high politics, there is an authoritarian government who wipes out the judges, uh, cuts down media. You have apparently a vivid, so, say, civil society who is standing up. 
probably in Poland more than in Hungary, but even in Hungary, you can measure it, as I said with the mayor of Budapest. And so what I'm observing, this doesn't give an answer to the questioner, but what I'm observing is still at least that one should look at parallel tendencies. Mm -hmm. You can say there's an authoritarian government, and this is how we talk about these things. But underneath the surface, there's something different. And the hope is just that we are not going to lose this. Because then something can happen like with Poland, that out of the blues, within a couple of weeks, the situation just is a game-changing thing. If, we, if Duda is away, it's a game-changing event for Poland. And I guess something will follow. So perhaps in, say, half a year, Poland is no longer an authoritarian state, yeah? So at least to put this into the balance. So I, I find it interesting. We've, we've been talking um, for just over 40 minutes and um, we've been talking about Europe and I don't think you've mentioned Brexit at all. It's been somewhat conspicuous through its, through its absence. And of course, this is an important month for the Brexit process. Before sort of posing a question to you about Brexit, let me, let me um, tee it up by saying that the German Marshall Fund recently conducted a poll and found that more than half of Americans believe that the UK is the most influential country in Europe. But in France and Germany, the number of people who seem to think this did not even reach double digits. So there seems to be a very different perception of um, what's, what the role of the UK is uh, on this side of the Atlantic and in the two countries that you're the most familiar with, France and Germany. So I guess the, the question I have for you is, what role do Brexit and the United Kingdom play in all of this as you think about the future of Europe? Thank you for the question. And I indeed didn't mention Brexit so far because I had so many other things to mention. But yes, obviously Brexit is approaching and um, it's going to be tough. Um, to this perception first, um, I can't hold back that little, say, irony, I guess that probably the perception gap stems from the fact that most of the American observers of Europe observe Europe through British or English speaking journals. Probably it's the FT, The Economist, perhaps The Guardian that you read, and it's probably much less Le Monde, FAZ, whatever. And um, I think that's part of the truth, or it's probably 100% of the truth, because um, if you read the English-speaking newspapers, um, you only get 50% of what is really happening in the European Union, mm -hmm. and then you lose the other 50% over the Atlantic. Uh, there's always this perception gap, because if you look through the British lenses and, lit and the English-speaking community on Europe, then, then, then there is a loose end. Um, perhaps with the difference of The Guardian. The Guardian is probably building up as one of the most important journal for basically the world when it comes to Europe. Because the economists, I, I, just to do a little bit media analysis, the economists talk Europe down ever. They shouldn't be yelling at all. They were the ones who filed the European constitution in the trash basket in 2003. They got what they wanted. I mean, that the liberal sort of Brits are now remain camp uh, in their sorrow about Brexit is partly the fault of this liberal anti-European press that the UK always had. And it's, it's sad. Uh, Little less, but for the FT, with the exception of Wolfgang Münchau and Martin Wolf and some who were always, say, Keynesian European, um, it's the same tragedy for the FT that sort of the outstanding journals of this continent would always write Europe down. Now we are in this weird situation of Brexit looming at the horizon, and um, I think it's really critical, and on both sides of the Atlantic. Let's look at a couple of things. Let's look first on um, the economic relation. Um, I have been talking a lot to the British ambassador here in Vienna, Leigh Turner, but also to um, British diplomatic staff in Berlin. And um, to be very honest, and I say this as a true European, but also very sympathy to the UK, um, 
what is tragic about is that I sense that we are promising to stay friends and we won't stay friends. And it's a tragedy. Um, what you can hear if you are listening through the words, like I say, um, the economic uh, potential for the UK is to race to the bottom. Yeah, And that is basically what you see in the last ends of negotiation, which is um, the UK wants to stay in the single market. If they want to stay in the single market, then they need to comply with social and ecological regulation. Mm -hmm. And that is what they do not want. Uh, basically, they call it now British sovereignty, which is sovereignty on regulation. But what they really want is to go cheap, which is go away with social and uh, ecological regulation. So this has two sides. It's not really promising for the UK worker to be left behind regulations because race to the bottom may be good for the city of London, but it may probably not good for those who voted for Brexit in the first place. The industrial workers in Northern England will probably not be happy if Britain goes cheap, right? There is on the opposite, a real risk that continental firms go UK because the uh, Amel Canal is not really a broad channel, yeah? So um, having uh, whatever planned in the UK, if the regulation does not apply, perhaps we will see the inverse movement, yeah? That some continental firms go to the continent to avoid European regulation. I think, pro I think uh, it will be messy and I think we are not done with this. The interesting thing is that for two years we are trying to disentangle the continent and the UK in economic terms and we are basically realizing what we are realizing since two years that it's undoable, yeah? That you have half a million nitty gritty details about the uh, continental workers in say German plants in the UK, inversely British uh, citizens living in the continent, having a land house in whatever southern France, what is about their retirements, their fundings and so on and so forth. So that was about industry. Looking at the citizens, it's even worse. Uh, there is an interesting, uh, uh, how do you say, plaint at the European Court of Justice and the plaint has been deposited a couple of days ago by some people of the Remain camp. And what they claim is that the ECG says that European citizenship is of permanent status. Mm -hmm. Permanent status means that the European citizenship has been accorded to the British citizen as to all European citizens through the Treaty of Maastricht in 92. And because European citizenship has been granted by the European Union, it cannot be withdrawn by the UK. So in theory, the UK as a country will be leaving the EU as a state, but the Britons as citizens keep European citizenship as permanent status. I, uh, I will be very curious what the European Court will be doing with this because this is really hot. It is really hot. I can't foresee what the ECG will do, but if ever permanent status should be granted, it would mean that British citizens are still under legislative control of the European Court, which would be very interesting for those who voted remain, but which will be very interesting for the Scots who want to remain in their large majority. So the dynamics of this nitty gritty legal detail might be very interesting and might have domino effects. Let's now turn to the foreign policy things. Everybody knows that say NATO has four serious armies, the US, France, the UK and Turkey. Say the US is um, the US and withdrawing now from NATO in a way. Um, the UK is exiting the EU. Turkey is not a serious army under current condition for the EU neither. So continental Europe is left with the French army. Mm -hmm. I guess I do not need to detail to an American audience what that means. And that is basically a no-go. So if it's a no-go, then the foreign policy dynamics and the dynamics of nuclear forces and the British army and what the army does in Africa and the street of Hormuz and so on and so forth, will be tremendously important. And um, 
how to find a matrix between the economic dimension of Brexit, the citizen dimension of Brexit, the Scottish question of Brexit, regional component and the foreign policy component. I don't have a crystal ball, um, but unfortunately as a European, I must admit it will be nitty gritty and it will be rough. I, I have no illusion that it won't be rough. Well, that's, that's a great segue um, to a, a broader question as we start to wrap up. I mean, most of our conversation this morning, this afternoon, has been about Europe and what's going on within Europe. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about relations abroad. You've touched on China a couple of times. And I, I think it's fair to say that at the moment, Europe is feeling somewhat marginalized between China and the U.S. And um, obviously, in the plans for Germany's presidency, there was a lot of hope on a big EU-China summit in mm -hmm. September. Um, mm -hmm. This summit has now been postponed because of the pandemic. But I'd, I'd like to, to ask you to talk a little bit about why this summit was important and, and why the postponement is important as well. Well, the postponement, I think, is really due to uh, COVID-19, to a second wave in China and this sort of global mobility uh, being at stake question. So uh, postponed to when is the question. The China uh, summit of the EU, basically, to put it under German presidency is naheliegend, is the easiest thing to explain because Germany's export ratio with China doubles or triples the one of France and of the UK. So there's a huge discrepancy between what Germany is doing with China because we are so strong in machinery, in industries, uh, automobile industry. Um, China is uh, French, the French are essentially selling Louis Vuitton stuff to the Chinese upper class. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it was sort of evident that um, Germany would do or host the European China summit. Um, in terms of the geoeconomic or geo strategic dimension, um, far from having answers because everybody, if you look at all these, you know, chats which we are having these days with the Center of European Reform in London and Mark Leonard and what he's writing, the European Council on European Relations, I, I just can point to you the new paper of Mark Leonard who wrote a paper about uh, European-Chinese relations after pandemia. Um, I think everybody's a little bit um, trying to find the light and uh, we do not know and, um, but we, we do not know where it should be heading towards, but we know what drives our anxiety. And uh, let me start from that point. I think COVID-19, like if you do X-rays, showed to Europe the dependency from China. We have been hearing about the uh, Silk, Silk Road before. We knew that Chinese is sort of eating into the European territory through the Balkans, on pathing via Bulgaria, buying the harbor of um, Piraeus, buying the harbor, few know, but of Trieste during banking crisis when the European Union refused to recapitalize the Italian banks, the Chinese were lending the money to Italy in exchange for the harbor of Trieste. The last harbor they bought is the ha uh, internal domestic harbor of Duisburg, not a very important harbor, but still a harbor in the middle of Germany. And if you go up, you will end up with the harbor of both Hamburg and um, Amsterdam, yeah, Rotterdam. So the, the, the Silk Road thing is a very important thing. And if you see the dependencies uh, in the Western Balkans from China, then it's even more ugly, may I say. Because in the meantime, many have been waking up and say, okay, does this sort of merchandise things come with supervision, with uh, moral scrutiny, with digital control? Uh, it goes down to little things like, I don't know whether in the US it's all also famous, but we have an app um, which is like Instagram called TikTok. Mm -hmm. And TikTok is a Chinese owner and uh, all the kids in Germany are playing with TikTok. And uh, so the data, the data mining that the Chinese are doing is unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, and I think there are two ways to look at this. Perhaps I'm, you must price in when I speak here that I'm born 64. I'm risen in the perspective of an ever closer Union Europe autonomous and so. 
um, and I'm still dreaming of that Europe, but I can realize that this Europe is increasingly squeezed between China and the US and this sort of strive for independency or strive for autonomy or strive for the ever closer union or strive to build a federal state. I mean, let's not forget that until 98, having a European federal state was in the party program of the CDU. That's 20 years ago. Let's just remind us that by 23, we still wanted a constitution. A constitution is a state building exercise, right? We may not, because then it turns ugly, discuss the relation between Iraq war and what the US did by that time and the relation between the European constitutional moment and the Iraq war. Some historians in some time will tell us interesting, interesting things about this, but I think it's fair to say that the Americans did not embrace the European constitutional moment and they had their ways to interfere. Yeah, fair enough, I think, at that point. But 15 years later, 17 years later, I think it's uh, fair to say that all this ever closer union business uh, is, is gone. And coming back to China, the interesting question is um, that in the first weeks of Corona, when the X-rays showed so clearly the dependency, I think there was a little moment, a uh, window of opportunity where this European sort of debate was back. Okay, we need to do Siemens Alstom. We need to build a European train. We need to have high-speed trains in Europe going from Copenhagen to Lisbon and from Budapest to Prague and it needs to, uh, to Paris and it needs to be European Siemens Alstom. We do not want to buy the Chinese trains. We do not want the Chinese to copy uh, Airbus 380 and so on and so forth. Yeah? But the longer it lasted, I feel like it's, by the way, with many things in the pandemic, I mean, just remember three months, three months ago, we were all, the world will be different. It will be, we, we are killing the debt break. We are now spending money like we can. We are flooding the system with money. Uh, we are uh, killing the 60% debt ratio. We were basically reinventing the world and everything seemed possible. And among the many things that seemed possible was the independent, courageous, autonomous Europe. Mm -hmm. Three months later, I think people have understood there's no way around China and that this emancipatory claim, be it political or economic, is not working. And that path dependency drives us both to the US and to China. And in some way, we'll need to deal with it. And dealing with it is the cutting China as a partner just because we realize that it's perhaps less a partner than an enemy and then it's controlling us. It's bad to see this, but still there's no way beyond partnership. And in this respect, I think postponement of the Chinese EU summit is a good thing because it gives us more time to reconsider the autonomy question, but still um, we are basically going back to normal also in the China-EU relations, more than we thought, say, three months ago. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for those insights. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to ask you one, one final question um, coming, coming back to Europe. I mean, obviously, you just talked about how you and, and others dream of a strong, autonomous and, and united Europe. And obviously, there's a lot of work to be done both internally and externally on, about that. But at the outset of our conversation today, you talked about the incredibly high expectations that others have of Germany and that Germany has of itself during this period um, as, as president of the, the European Council. And so I guess my, my closing question to you is, what should we be watching over the next six months as we try to understand whether Germany is meeting those expectations or not? Well, thank you for this tricky last question. Um, Germany will not be able to do anything alone. The classical German toolbox to do successful European policy were three things. Franco-German relation, listening to the smaller countries like Benelux, and strengthening the so-called supranational elements of the EU system, which is the Parliament and the Commission. In a way, I would argue that after losing these things for at least 10 years, 
Nobody looked at the parliament and the commission in the past decade. Nobody looked at the Benelux countries in the last decade and Franco-German tandem was somewhere, but not really alive. I would argue that the three things are coming back. The commission is back from the line. The small countries are back, although they are the frugal four, but if Merkel, who is not a real sort of visionary of Europe, but still in negotiation, she is good. Yeah, this balancing thing. So I, I'm not concerned that at the end of the day with the frugal four, there will be a compromise. That's not my concern. Everybody needs a budget, even the Dutch and the Austrian know we need a budget. Um, so the commission is back, the small countries are somehow back and the Franco-German engine we talked a lot about is back. Still, these are, as I tried to map out here, the classical instruments and European policy have shifted towards the citizens, the mayors, regions, so. So what you should be watching out is, first, the European court and permanent status. I think, I, I don't know when the court must decide, will decide, whatever, may last some time, but you should be watching out because this is a game changer. If the court grants permanent status to European citizens, that's a message. Mm -hmm. And the message is the citizens decide in the EU and the citizens are the sovereign. No country, the country can leave, the citizens stay. It's a big, bold message. Mm -hmm. What you should be looking out is the Polish elections. Duda out of office could be a dominant effect for Prague, Babish, Orban will probably not survive another decade. Um, so game changing thing too. What you should be watching out is German industry. Because what I am in a way dreaming of I'm always arguing as a social scientist that social civil society can want a lot and civil society wants a lot. Yeah, this participatory democracy, the whole thing, Green New Deal. But without industry, without an economic driver, nothing happens. So the big game changer that already we have seen and probably being leading to Merkel Macron was that German industry changed opinion. And for the first time, in difference to the crisis of 10 years ago, even conservative and even liberal economists like uh, Martin Hüter or Clemens Fuß would be outspoken for Corona bonds. And they did not do so 10 years ago. So public opinion, especially among industries, has changed. And I gave you the reasons, no more export to China, automo automobile on industry specs. So Germany depends much more of the single market. And so if you can observe an alliance uh, of the Confindustria Medef BDI with civil society to be bold on Europe, it would combine desires of civil society and of European citizens with economic drivers. So this is to be watched out too. Obviously, the EU-China summit matters. Mm -hmm. Obviously, whether we get a budget will matter. Um, and uh, I think for six months, that's already a lot to be watched out. The real problem is over expectation, over expectation. Six months is such a short time. Obviously, and I'm not in denial, Europe has been in bad shape before Corona. And after Corona, it's in even worse shape. Mm -hmm. Can Merkel fix all that in just six months? And will that be lasting is the real question. I can only hope that she can, or at least that there is an impulse and that the impulse creates a domino effect. Mm -hmm. But as we are in, in the dependency here, Europe is looking to November and the US election. And I tell you what, what happens in the US will perhaps be the biggest driver for what happens in Europe in both ways. Yeah. And so um, I guess that's also one of the results of COVID-19, that the interdependency of the world has been um, improving. We have been seeing this. But what is fascinating to me is that we are both, on both sides of the Atlantic, moving out of classical schemes of how policy is done. I'm, I'm again back to what is happening in your towns with the racist question and how we frame the whole thing. And so I think the most interesting thing to follow is whether we can detect something here for the future and rebuild a common future or even rebuild a common transatlantic relation, which is no longer the US and the EU, uh, Washington, Brussels, 
but the layers below. And I think the attractive work of institutions like the American Council <laughs> and the European Democracy Lab, I think lies in these arenas. So I think there's something to watch out in these innovation of politics arena. To give you one last word on that, if you want to Google something, uh, we've talked already about the conference on the future of the European Union that Mrs. von der Leyen will be doing. But there is a sort of counter project because many say this is a top down project. The commission interviews the people, but there is a bottom up project and that is hashtag citizens take over Europe. So if you Google hashtag citizens take over Europe, it's basically more than 30 European NGOs who have been bundling to do what? to create a European constituent, uh, uh, constitutional assembly and they are writing a European constitution even before Mrs. von der Leyen has interviewed the people. Mm -hmm. So what is interesting is this double momentum of the EU listening to the citizens now but the citizens building the new Europe from scratch and I think that is where the future is. And although it's still sublimated, it's not yet high politics, I think that's the most interesting thing to watch. Well, Ulrike, it is always great to talk with you. And I want to thank you so much for all of your insights over the last hour or so. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, obviously, there's a lot to watch on both sides of the Atlantic, but we'll be watching Europe very closely, just as you'll be watching the developments in the United States up to our election very closely. And I hope that we can continue the conversation at some point over the next few months, perhaps towards the end of the EU uh, uh, Council presidency, and maybe reflect on today's discussion and see uh, how much progress has been made with all of the, the tasks that lie ahead. Um, but it's wonderful to see you in this format. I wish you well, stay healthy, and thanks for being with us today. Same to all. I, I, I mean, I greet all the American listeners here on the other side of the Atlantic. I'm very sad that I couldn't be there in life, but I hope to be back very, very soon. And uh, Stephen, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to always a pleasure to be with the ACG. Good. Well, good to see you. Take okay. care and bye good bye. bye to all of our viewers today. Bye bye. Bye.